Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this Kamunda webinar here uh, in uh, sunny Berlin in Kamunda Towers. Um, this is going to be a, uh, a fun little chat about um, Kamunda's new feature from 7.5, which is a process instance migration, and uh, who you'll be listening to for the next hour or so is uh, myself, uh, Niall Dehan, and Torben Lindhauer. Uh, I will be, well, I'm not massively familiar with the inner workings of this particular feature, which is why I'm going to be here asking Torben to explain how things work. And he will hopefully be able to um, answer uh, those things. And uh, okay, uh, let me just get some confirmation that we can see that okay. Can you see it okay, Torben? That's green. Um, it's a bit dodgy. Um, okay, so. Let us try this. Do, do, do. Better? Can you see it okay? Do, do, do. Uh, okay, and um, yeah, I think we can probably see it a little better now. Okay, great. So um, now that we have our, um, our mic working and our presentation working, uh, let's get started. So first of all, the agenda for today is going to be basically, first of all, uh, we have, we've done the introductions. So I'm going to go in and talk about uh, some of the early, uh, the initial challenge with actually um, implementing this feature. I'm going to discuss very briefly how this feature actually works from a uh, API level, uh, specifically the Java API, but because it's built on top of the REST API is built on top of it, it'll probably give you a pretty good idea on, on how that works. Um, I'll really quickly demo the cockpit, uh, cockpit's implementation of, um, of how this actual API works and show you how to actually migrate processes and how to make a process plan. And then we will discuss a few questions with Torben about um, the sort of the theater workings of how this works and how Torben went about making it. So because of that, uh, we would ask that if during the course of this particular little demo at the first 25 minutes, if you see any questions or think of any questions you want to ask uh, Big T over here, then uh, feel free to um, uh, type them in the chat window, and then we'll get around to those as we, um, uh, as we get closer to the end of the uh, presentation. Okay. So um, next up. Do, do, do. So here, as I mentioned, was the challenge. Uh, first of all, it, as things stand, Commanda has the ability to run two process definitions, uh, well, two, one process definition on two different versions at the same time, pretty easily, and uh, they don't affect each other. So at the moment, if you, have, if you change your process uh, and deploy it to a, a running production server or something, you actually won't affect the currently running instances. Um, and that's really, really useful. That's something people really liked. It meant they could have two. Uh, it meant that any time a process was running, it always um, uh, finished on the same uh, version that it started on. Uh, this, of course, wasn't always the case. That um, this one second. Which I think I've just got a mess of the slides are this side here. Nope, wrong way. There we go. Also, um, slides are now in view. Fantastic. That's a good start. So um, thanks, Torben, uh, for, for the feedback. Uh, so yeah, so if we, we, we actually got a lot of uh, feedback from customers asking about, and, and actually the um, open source community, that they wanted a really easy way of migrating uh, from one process instance version to another. And uh, this was kind of the, what spurred us on. And as you can see here, one of the main challenges is what do you do? You can't just migrate straight, straight across to a new version automatically, of course, because many things can change. You can see in the example on this slide, we have a version one which has uh, a step C and that's removed in version two. So what do you do with those um, instances? So with this challenge in mind, uh, um, Torben and a few of the developers here, actually who, who else was involved in the migration stuff, Daniel and Sebastian as well? Um, mainly Sebastian Lensky and myself. Okay. And Daniel supported us and Sebastian Stamm did a lot of stuff in the front end of the cockpit. 
Ah, yeah. So um, it took a few different guys a little while to get this um, working, but it's a really strong feature. It's a really, really good addition to 7.5. So here is the process that you actually go through in order to migrate some uh, process instance. The first thing you do is you create a migration plan. A migration plan is kind of like an object that has all the information about how you're actually going to move these instances to the new version. Stuff like it'll have the two process uh, definitions and uh, versions that you want to uh, merge or migrate to and from. It'll also have uh, the how each individual uh, activity is linked to one of the other versions. Once you create this object, you're actually able to apply that migration plan to um, to the uh, uh, to the engine and just basically uh, launch this API call that actually takes the uh, migration plan as a um, as a what's it, a parameter, and then it'll eventually work. Okay, so um, how does that actually look uh, from an API point of view? It looks like this. The top section here is actually um, a pretty straightforward way in which you would create a migration plan. The, using the runtime service, you basically use the create uh, migration plan in which you specify um, two process keys with colon separating their version number. And after that, you basically add various mapped activities. So we're saying from example process version one, there is an assess credit card worthiness um, Activity, and that's the activity ID, and of course that will go to the one of the same variable, one of the same name on the uh, next one. You can also, of course, link um, map activities that have wildly different names, and the idea is that you build this particular, um, you build this particular uh, um, migration process, uh, migration uh, map plan, in order to sort of run this uh, in a single go, in a single call. So the single call that, that does that is actually right there um, uh, below it. It's where we have a migration plan. We have our list of process instance IDs that we actually want to um, perform this migration with. And we use the runtime service to pr produce a new migration and uh, executing that is how it works. Uh, then you have um, a pretty simple way to migrate processes from one um, instance to another. Make sense? Yeah, yep. good stuff. And later on, we'll be discussing uh, with Torben a little more about how this sort of works um, and the decisions made by uh, what the impact of actually this migration could be. So while, of course, you could do it directly using the API, um, another um, fellow here, Sebastian Stam, he's uh, a guy who's uh, done a lot of work in Kotlin already, um, in conjunction with uh, Torben, has created a uh, Kotlin plugin that allows you to map your uh, migration plan as well as execute the migration itself. So, uh, and I'll be demoing that just now. That essentially does what the, it does a little bit more even actually than the, uh, the API suggests because it's, uh, it's a really nice feature. In terms of how this relates to the um, e uh, enterprise version, well, obviously the, just like as, as usual with every release, the engine itself is entirely open source. The Java API is, of course, open source, and everything about the REST API is, of course, open source. The thing I'll be showing you just now, which is the Kotlin plugin, is uh, an implementation of that API, and that is part of the enterprise um, um, edition of the, of the software. Okay, so it's demo time, and I am going to try and do something about the screen, so bear with me. Mm -hmm. Okay, it might take a couple seconds to refresh. I'm going to try and see if I can prevent this thing from. Uh... Yeah, it looks alright. Probably refreshed. Let's see if I bring. Uh... Let's see where I'm going to start with. Okay, can you see that? Maybe I need to, one moment, I'm just going to try and... Okay, let's reshare the screen, let's see how that goes. Okay. 
Awesome. And we're alive and well. Fantastic. Okay, so that's. They switch the window, perhaps. Mm, how this goes. The book. Try portrait. <laughs> that will not work. <laughs> um, well, we'll just, just make the window smaller. Maybe. This one here, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's our best bet. Okay, great. So. You can probably see this pretty well. So here is uh, the deployment for Commando. And um, what's that? So sorry, I'm reloading this also. So I'm just missing. Uh, right, okay, so I'll bring this way up. It's still way too big. Yep. Let's actually try this. That'll have to do. Okay. And. Um, so earlier today, I deployed um, a process to Cockpit, and it is this is the new look Cockpit for 7.5. If you haven't already tried it out, you should take a look. And in here, we have two processes. We have the default um, invoice receipt process, and we also have this shiny new um, process migration process. And this guy has various instances running in here. It's got two tasks here and here and one there. I should probably maybe try and create another one just for fun. And to start, great stuff. Um, very little, small. Very small. Okay, there we go. Oh, I see. Make it a little bit wider to the right. <laughs> this is. Really fun guessing game. Uh, I think we have it. Yeah. Okay, so now we have um, basically a um, this process that has loads of fun stuff going on and loads of instances everywhere. We have them all listed there in the bottom. And now I'm going to um, basically mess around with this model. I'm going to add some things, take away some things, and then redeploy it in order to um, uh, to see how the second version works. So this shouldn't be as hard. I'm going to do, open up the Commander Modeler. And here is our, um, our lovely process here. And I'm going to, let's say, uh, let's delete this task here. I'm going to create a parallel gateway here. And create a new task down here, maybe. New user task and something new, and then an end event, fantastic. So in this process, what's actually gonna happen is that we have a, a start event here. We have a user task first, then we have an XOR gateway. So the process will either go up this way and do task three, or it will go and do task four. Then we have a parallel gateway at this point, it will either it'll both send the token this way to finish, which doesn't make too much sense, but you know these things happen, and it'll also uh, go down here and do something new, and that's an idea for um, how this is going to uh, uh, work. Obviously, this is uh, quite a big difference from our previous process that does all other various things. We might actually make it even more sort of different if that makes sense. We could maybe add another. Maybe a default flow or something would be nice. Why not? Any suggestions from the audience, of course, welcome. Um, if someone out there has a favorite symbol, maybe we want to see it. <laughs> this is your time to ask. We take requests occasionally. Um, OK, so I'll just make this default. And I will turn this into a user task. And this was the something else. Okay, so now I have my new process, which uh, looks uh, distinctly different to the last one. And now I just need to actually build this and deploy it. And to do that, I'm going to use um, Eclipse, where I have my project. And of course, Eclipse looks great when it's absolutely tiny. So we'll do that. And um, here's my 
here's my migration process demo project. Uh, I'm just going to refresh it. We have the actual process we've been working on right in there. So now I'm just going to uh, build this with Maven and deploy it to the Wildfly um, uh, uh, come under uh, distribution that we're using right now. And I'm going to run that. And I'm sure that everything will go exactly the plan and that will build perfectly and deploy because that's the way things have been going. Uh, and hey, we've got a build failure. That was, that was great. So let's see, see what happened there. Um, doo -doo -doo. Fail to execute process related rollback. Ooh, let's actually go and try and build it regularly and see if we run some tests. That's always fun. So I'm going to open this guy up. This is my H2 test where I can actually use H2 to in order to uh, actually start up the engine with an Eclipse and then run the new process model through it. So I'm going to run as, yep. And now we can see what I forgot. Okay, that's a much nicer stack trace to look at. Um, ah, an exclusive gateway without condition. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so let's go and fix that. So what I forgot to do was that I forgot to add a condition to one of my gateways. It wasn't this one. Um, must have been this one. It was this one. Hooray, this is our winner. So uh, this should have, basically this one is going to use a variable, task four. And this particular guy here is going to say, not task four. Thank you, incredibly useful error message. You've saved the day again. Okay. Uh, now that should probably make, that should probably be it, hopefully. And let's, Let's go all in and try and actually deploy it straight to uh, Wildfly again. Ha ha, success. Great, my optimism was well-founded. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to refresh this page and we should see that we now have our process as we left it with all those lovely instances floating around. And we also have process two, um, which we created with some minor errors and it is uh, currently empty. There's no processes running. If I were to start a new process here in task list, of course, it would start the newest version. Uh, because Tasklist runs the start process instance by key, which always gets the latest version of the process and starts that. So you can see here we are. So uh, now for the fun part, now we're actually going to say, I would like my processes for task one to be moved to task two, where it's just nicer. Um, there's more symbols. Everyone likes more symbols. So I'm going to click here and I don't have a license. Awesome. So uh, before I do that, I'm going to try. <laughs> this is a lesson to all those enterprise, <laughs> enterprise users. Make sure you have a license key available. Um, I'm going to really quickly uh, do this. And because I can't show the license key, obviously, uh, that would be too easy. That'd be a really interesting way of getting a license. And uh, while I'm doing that, actually, Torben can maybe. Um, uh, fill us in on uh, a question that came through, which was um, what uh, additional benefits you can actually use or are possible for using um, this two-step approach of being able to create a migration plan before actually migrating the process itself. Uh, yeah, as you saw, the, the APIs are separate. So there's one for creating a migration plan for, a, for two process definitions that you want to migrate and one that is you can give the plan to and then give it some process instance ID, so also process instance query, and then it applies the plan to all the instances that are provided. And the benefit of this is um, that you can apply one migration plan a lot of times. Um, so, you, 
at some point in the future, we might even have this as a feature in the, in the process engine that you can persist the migration plan and then um, decouple creation of a migration plan, which is perhaps a task that someone is able to perform who, who models the process and separate that from uh, executing the migration plan, which would probably be a different kind of role in the organization. So people actually migrate in process instances at runtime. So that's the, the motivation to separate these two concerns. Yeah, thanks, Arturo. And that uh, lucky uh, that little chat helped me get back on track. So um, what we're seeing now is actually the migration plan uh, that I've created. So because I went from that particular uh, that particular link, I went from uh, right here where I clicked on uh, migrate the current version. It basically got the version I was on and the newest version that was possible. Um, the migration, of course, can be a little more robust than that because you can select multiple versions you can, or select multiple um, types. So for instance, we can actually migrate from one definition to another, not just from one version to another, which is a really big deal. Um, and you can also see that um, when I select this, these two, the engine has already, um, or the or task list actually, this, this cockpit, um, has already actually generated a migration plan based on uh, what it already knows for the two models. So you can see this guy here is uh, task one is linked to uh, task one here. And same as task four is also linked. So these have already been uh, established. Ones that aren't, you'll see, are this guy here that we deleted. Uh, so task two has nowhere to go, which is very sad. Um, just a few more bits and pieces about this particular um, thing at uh, this particular uh, UI. The first thing is that uh, these are, as you can see, these two guys are linked. Um, so if you drag one, you can drag the other as well. And another nice little feature is that you can actually um, just unlink them so that they sort of are uh, executable separately. So you can kind of zoom into one area and see how that one is linked in a grander skew, if you like. So I quite like that. <laughs> Um, another nice thing is that you can show the full migration plan with these lovely arrows. So that shows what's possible. And that's currently what's generated. But obviously, you might want a lot more power over exactly what to migrate. So what we can do is we can, first of all, decide that I don't like this particular mapping. I don't want it to go there. Instead, I would like it to go, let's say, down here. And that's perfectly fine. There's also a certain amount of feedback you get. So for instance, if we actually map this one to, let's say, um, a gateway or something, we've got a little X there. And if you click on the error mapping, it'll tell you, um, let's see if I click on it, yep, that it, uh, activities are incompatible. Because you can only, of course, migrate um, to similar activities. You can't, obviously, migrate from a uh, activity to a gateway or, um, or some kind of um, event. Okay, so we can also, as you as you saw, we can also map the um, we can also cancel all the mapping and just decide to map one or more, uh, just just one instance. And the re and you can see these are warnings rather than errors because it's not necessary that you actually need to map everything. It's very possible that you could just want to migrate um, processes that are here in this one task. And in which case, you actually don't need to map these anyway, because you won't be moving them. So the, while this will give you a warning, it'll actually let you proceed. Uh, for this particular use case, of course, I'm actually just going to connect everything up, because that's the completionist in me. Um, I'm going to unlink these diagrams to make things easier for me. Do And this one again to this one. Great. So they're all linked and look very cool. And now we can move forward to selecting the instances. So this is the second part of the mapping. This is where we actually select which process instances we actually want to move across. Uh, by default, they're all of them. Um, but there's also a filter system here. So you can filter by um, business key or, or variable um, or probably quite commonly by um, activity ID if you only wanted to um, uh, use one activity, if you only wanted to migrate from one particular activity. Okay, so in this case, I'm just going to grab a few at random and select them. Why not? And just see how they look. So next up, we have this lovely guy here. 
And um, this is basically our sort of final page. Just before we click the big red button, it gives us uh, some information, that, a bit of a warning here that tells us that we're playing with fire and we should maybe be careful before um, stepping forward, which is a, a very good warning. Uh, we have some tick boxes here. The asynchronous one um, is kind of intended for large batches. So for instance, if you were to, if I were to untick this, it would actually migrate all of these in one transaction. Uh, but if you had maybe 10,000 instances, that would not be a good idea because you would get transaction timeouts and you would end up failing your migration. And uh, we also have uh, skip custom listeners and um, skip IO mapping, of course. That is useful if um, your process application contains these mappings or, or code and beans that are called by mappings or listeners. Uh, and cockpit isn't available of these mappings, so it's rather an advanced setting, and we can leave it like it is at the moment. Yeah, okay, awesome. Uh, so we have here the, so the source and target for each of our guys here, um, and of course we have um, the payload that will actually be sent. So obviously I showed you guys the um, Java API for uh, migrating, and as I mentioned already, that the, Java, the REST API is built on top of that. Um, as you can see here, the difference is the payload is still a, uh, a migration plan, but it's in JSON, of course, instead of, um, Java, instead of a Java object. Okay, so next up, if we click Execute, we should arrive here at this lovely spot here where we have executed um, our batch. The reason that a batch came up is purely because we did it as asynchronously. So it'll store that batch as something that is a job that will be that'll keep going. Uh, obviously, we only had four instances, so it finished uh, pretty quickly. So we can see here a total of four jobs, um, four complete, and uh, everything went very successfully and no failed jobs. That's a nice change to the way things usually go. And uh, as you can see, also now it is completed. It's actually found this page auto refreshes. So it's now found that the job of Batching this is now completed and it's updated that page. Okay, so now to prove uh, what actually happened was true, we still have the same number of instances, and now we should have a bunch of uh, process instances bouncing around in um, our uh, our process definition. Okay, so um, that is uh, sort of the cockpit view and that sort of thing. And another thing I might want to do is actually show you. Um, something that's actually a little more complex, but it's really, really cool. Um, I use very basic symbols there, but obviously you can use subprocesses and adding those is a lot more complexity. And um, if we open back up our model, we could do something like, uh, let's say I'll grab this guy. Um, well, I'll grab a subprocess first. I'll connect up this to that. And then I will select these two guys. So now we have um, a whole different sort of scenario here where we have, instead of being able to map to a specific uh, user task, we now have something that's embedded within its own subprocess, which is a little more complex. Um, and uh, I think, what else should we do? Maybe we will also add a Timer, maybe it could be kind of fun. I don't know. We can talk about that later. Go to the boundary event. Yeah, it's just a boundary event in there. So let's add this guy here. It won't make much difference because we're actually. Oh, I would actually. Yeah, let's actually add a add him a signal. And let's make that signal called Howdy. Okay, so then that signal will be very important because it will do absolutely nothing but interrupt the task and end the process. Okay, so we've added a few additional things. And the reason I'm doing that is actually because, uh, not because I wanna see my project break again when I try and build it, but actually because um, these add really interesting questions about how the API works. So those first options were really easy. We just moved stuff from user tasks to user tasks, but things get a little more complex when suddenly you find yourself moving from you one user task to a user task with a boundary event. So I'm going to, once again, refresh my project and Emboldened by the fact that it built pretty well last time, I'm going to do the same again this time. Mm 
Uh, as I predicted, perfect. And uh, now if we go back to cockpit and check out our process, we should have a version three, hopefully. We do indeed, awesome. And there it is alive and well. So um, I just wanna to talk to Torben maybe about these particular, what actually it is that is going to happen when we actually migrate this guy to this boundary event. And also what's happening here with this guy and this activity. So do you wanna start off Torben just maybe explain a little bit about the API and how it sort of handles this particular type of mapping? Uh, yes. Um, so the, the first example that I showed was two structurally very similar processes. So both had just user tasks and slightly different names and slightly different order and that way we are to migrate things. Um, what we have done now is change the structure of the process diagram a little bit more by adding the boundary event and the sub process. Um, and the migration logic is going to instantiate the necessary um, engine entities that are required to execute these. So what we're going to expect when we migrate process instances from, from the left to the right here um, is that afterwards we are able to signal the or trigger the signal boundary event and also the sub process will be instantiated during migration. So the process instances are going to be in a consistent state afterwards. Similar would be the other way around. So it's also possible to remove a sub process or to, to remove a boundary event, and then it's not possible anymore after migration to trigger the boundary event. And I'm going to just spin that. I'm going to use a non-synchronous one. I'm going to use a synchronous one this time, so it'll just straight away finish. And back in our lovely process hovel here, we have all these guys happy. And as Torben mentioned, this you, is now possible. You should also see now if, the, if you go into the instance that is, has the active version or for the sub process you should also see now that you have an instance of the sub process so if you go back to the definition and go into the process instance for that that's the wrong one wrong one was selected oh right sorry my bad there we go yeah, no. that's better so you now see that the sub process is also instantiated yeah so that's kind of an interesting one there because we actually have to generate a new token of course for that particular scenario so um and I'm actually just wondering, um, how does this work if it was a timer event out of interest? Yeah, that's interesting because for timer events, there's two cases um, for migrations. So one is that you add a timer event and you want to start it from, from or initialize it. And the other is that the timer event basically stays the same. So you have a timer event, boundary event that is, triggers after five minutes and you migrate the process instances to a process definition that has the same boundary event and also has um, the timer boundary event for five minutes. So in that case, you want to have the timer boundary event to just continue, so to not be reinitialized. And this is also what you can use the migration mapping instructions for. So if you map a timer boundary event to another timer boundary event, the timer state is going to be preserved from, from the source boundary event to the target boundary event. If you do not have this instruction, then the timer or the job behind the timer boundary event of the process instance before migration is going to be removed, and a new timer job is created for the new timer boundary event, which essentially then means that um, the timer boundary event is going to be reinitialized, so it's going to trigger as defined in the target process definition. Mm -hmm. And is there a reason why I decided to give the option of, of restarting the timer rather than just always taking the exact same job and just taking whatever that is currently at. Yeah, we we seeing just seeing opportunities that or use cases for both of these options. So that is have to prove in practice, but um, we can think that both are, 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 are use are use cases that people have in, in real life. Okay, awesome. Um, one other thing that comes to mind is whenever we see um, that migration, that lovely migration guy there. Um, so let's try this process here. If we go to the migration tab for this process, we can see that we're able to link to this event here. The um, And that's almost certainly because it's got a transaction boundary. Um, so I'm wondering what, 
how do transaction boundaries affect migration in terms of what happens next when, after migration occurs? Yeah, technically the transaction boundary is represented by a job or an asynchronous continuation in the engine. So like a user task, this is a wait state. So the process, or when a process instance is executed, then it reaches the state of the transaction boundary and there it commits all its state and creates a job in the process engine database for later, con or for continuation um, by the job executor. And at that point, for a very small amount of time, um, the process instance does not execute, but is in a waiting state until the job executor continues. So if you migrate this process now at that point, um, then you also need a migration instruction from that activity where the job is at to another activity. And the constraint here is that the target activity also has a corresponding asynchronous continuation marker. So the async before flag or async after in, in the XML process model. So you can always migrate from something to anything with, but you can migrate to anything with a transaction boundary. Yes, correct. For these, uh, the type of the activity does not have to match. So you can migrate from async or, or not sure. Yeah. So it's yeah, yeah, it has, it has to match. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we can, we, we can try and break the edge and then try and, try and do something like that later. Yeah, but the migration plan will not validate if you if you map the user task to script task. Okay, yeah, yeah, makes sense, yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, um, we've got a few more bits and pieces to discuss, um, but if there are any more, any questions coming up, uh, do send them along. Uh, we'll be discussing a few bits and pieces that we think are pretty interesting to talk about, uh, but to make sure that you get all the information you're looking for, please feel free to, uh, to, to, to send them in the text box and then we will, um, we will uh, do that. Awesome. Um, so uh, now we noticed that there was uh, an asynchronous and uh, tick box there. Uh, is there actually an upper limit to the number of in process instances you can actually migrate? So fact is, um, we don't actually know because this very much depends on the environment that you use Kamunda in and your probably your application server configuration and your database configuration, for example, things like transaction timeouts. But what we did is before before we released seven five, Sebastian Mensky and I um, ran some some benchmarks basically where we set up a Postgres SQL database um, with its default settings, a default common uh, Tomcat installation running against that database. And we were able to migrate, um, of course, asynchronously uh, up to a, a million process instances. So this should already cover, I think, a lot of use cases. So we, we did not reach the limit where it does not work anymore, but we think it's rather high. <laughs> Over a million, anyway. Yeah. So I think that's quite a lot to migrate anyway. So I think it'd be kind of weird if you migrated more than that, but it'd be interesting to find out if somebody says like, you know, 2 million and four is the actual limit. At that point, we can't do anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's actually really good news. And is that available to user people? Can people uh, use this testing themselves? Like is it available on GitHub or? Um, no, that was basically more not ad hoc testing. So there's no framework or library that we publish for that purpose. Okay, so you just sort of like did it just for fun. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's awesome. Um, so another sort of thing that comes to mind actually is about uh, history because we've been looking entirely at runtime stuff, and I'm actually kind of wondering myself. I might click into it and see what happens when I actually click on the history tab here. And what actually happens? Um, there's not a huge map there. So, um, can you give me a uh, an idea of uh, what actually happens in terms of the history for process migration? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, basically, we did a very minimal approach there for the seven five version. So, history consists of two things. On the one hand, the history event stream that the engine publishes, and then there's also the default history handler that writes all these history events to the relational database and then puts it in the tables that we see in Cockpit here. Um, and on the history event stream, we have added a new event that is fired whenever an instance is migrated. So you get an event that a process instance migrates, that an activity instance migrates, that a user task instance migrates, and these kind of things, so all the things that are represented in the history. Um, and that way you can be notified that something migrates. 
Uh, in the default history event handler for the database, we did a minimal approach in the sense that we update the entities that are not yet finished. So the active process instances are assigned to the new process definition, but activity instances that have already completed at the time of migration are not going to be updated because or they are not going to reference the new process definition ID mm. because they were executed in the context of the source process yeah. definition. But they aren't gone, they're just... They are not gone. Yeah, they're just there somewhere. So you can always query, they may not appear in Kafka or whatever, but you can always query for Yeah, of course, you can query these. Yeah. Um, and I think we also have some potential to, to make this nice on Kafka. <laughs> okay, okay, so you're blaming someone else for... <laughs> straight, straight away, it's like Sebastian Stam, it's all his fault. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, that's actually yeah, it's, 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 so. Is that already on a roadmap for seven six, or is or, or uh, no? It's more of a a thing that is possible, sort of thing. Of so the nice thing is about cockpit is that of course cockpit is modular, so you can always create uh, cockpit plugins, and uh, we do have a, a quite a, quite a good variety of stuff on the. Um, uh, community created coffee plugins. So it's nice to know that these things are available there and you can always expand on the things that we produce. So we did all the hard work. And, uh, you can always uh, take this, uh, especially the source code, and then maybe add some additional stuff. And if you really feel like it, you can give us a pull request and we can uh, um, take that and maybe uh, give that back to the community as well. Okay. Um, so one other like fun little thing is about well, that I thought of was, let's see, if we go here and we go to migration. So if I select one of these two, uh, let's say this guy here. So it'll do all sorts of stuff automatically as soon as I select process instance. So I'm just sort of wondering um, what is happening when, when, I, when I do that? What, what is actually under the hood on, on this particular um, uh, process, like when it creates the uh, migration plan? Yeah, um, so as, you, as Niall said, um, the migration plan is not empty when you create it, which is very useful probably in cases where the process diagrams are very large and only very little portions of them change. Um, and this is um, a feature that we can make or generate certain migration instructions under certain conditions. And this is basically the case if activities are in the same scope and they have the same IDs by default. So process so if you map processes of the same of the other process migration demo process where the ids are very similar then we can successfully um, generate these instructions and save the user some effort to might map all the tasks that are the same anyway mm. if you have very different processes then this will not work as easily so the user has to do more manual work mm. um, but for very similar process models this saves some effort um, and this algorithm that generates these instructions is implemented in the backend. So this is not a front-end or cockpit concept. This is also part of the Java API to generate these instructions. Oh, right. um, and the algorithm is more or less um, exchangeable while not part of the API. There's an internal interface that can be implemented. And for example, if you want to change the logic that matches these activities, um, then you can do that. Oh, that's really useful. So if you like knew that certain things are always linked by name or something. For example. And you can go in and would you just override that class and just, or... Um, you, you would provide another implementation, implementation of, of, the same, same of the same suit. Yeah, okay, cool. And so you can do that. Um, that's really useful, actually. That's, um, that's, a, that's a nice little addition. Um, so let me think. What, oh, yeah, one other thing came to mind. There probably is, is there actually a difference from an API point of view of mapping from one process definition to another. Like this, like I can map stuff that's here to version three of this. Does the API care that it's a different source definition or is it all the same? After all, uh, it's basically all the same. So the API has to update process definition IDs and activity IDs of the related entities. So for example, user task. Um, and this doesn't matter if, if it's of the same, a process with the same key or if it's of a completely different process. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Um, so, and another thing that kind of came to mind as well uh, was, so we've also got a new, another great new feature for um, uh, 7.5 was released was 
the new implementation of multi-tenancy. It's uh, it, we now implement tenant markers as well as engine per tenant, and it's 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 a big difference because it's a lot more resource um, efficient. efficient. Yeah, thanks for correcting my English there, you dog. Um, okay, and so I was wondering if. Uh, T Dog, there could let me know what the uh, if we can actually combine these two features. Can how is the new tenancy thing related to process migration? Yeah, like like all the other APIs that we offer, um, migration is tenant aware as well. So it's not possible to um, migrate process instances of one tenant to a process definition of another tenant, and thereby making the state inconsistent and mm -hmm. linking data between tenants. So mm -hmm. this is taken care of in the back end and therefore not possible to um, yeah, crop the state. Okay, is that actually part of the API as well? Can you add a tenant or is it just taken care of by the process definition? Um, so there's the tenant is more or less transparent to the to the API. So this is in or more or less um, inherent in the process instance. So process instance belongs to a tenant. Ah, I see. Yeah. And then it's there's no for the migration API, you don't have to specify a tenant. Mm, so you just give it a process instance, and that instance already has a tenant it's associated yeah. to. So and if fine. you migrate in the context of the tenant, then, for example, the process instance query that you can submit is also restricted to the tenant of the authenticated user. Okay, cool. Um, is there any actually authorization on migration? Can you uh, change it in cockpit? Can you go in and say this person is not allowed to migrate stuff because we don't trust them, and you know. Yeah, okay. um, there's a new a new um, permission that you can assign an admin. We could even have a look. Um, ah, yeah, let's have a look. Okay, so uh, let's go to admin. Okay, and where is that? Is it in... um, it should be somewhere uh, authorizations manager. Ah, there we go. Yeah. And there you can. Um, so the tenants up there. Cool. I think it's a process definition. Oops. Uh, uh, there you go. And there should be a permission for migrating process instances now. Mm -hmm. Oh, here? Ah, right. So Create instance. One is, oh, that, yeah, that's a little bit up. There that's we go. Instance. Migrate instance. Okay, so you actually can, that's pretty good. You can actually um, add that. That's good because you, know, you don't want everyone sort of being able to migrate your stuff. Okay, that's really cool. Um, so another question that we have uh, is actually about how users are affected. So let's imagine that I'm a user, I'm using task one, and it's a, it's a really tough one because it's a, it's a tick box with a label. So that's, that's going to take some time. So uh, we need a couple of hours to do that. And while we're waiting, this gets migrated. Now, um, this is a pretty simple example, but what if we were in the middle of writing loads of, like we had a lot of data there. We just want to click complete. Uh, task one is pretty straightforward. It actually links to task one again, I think. So it actually, the migration doesn't even change the task type. So is if the user clicks complete on a migrated task, are they actually going to, um, are they, is, is it a task going to throw an error saying it doesn't exist anymore because Technically, we've migrated from that instance. Um, yeah, we try to build the API or the implementation of the API in a way that it affects ongoing process execution as little as possible. And this means that we um, try to modify as little state as possible of the related entities. Um, so if you have a very long running task, a user task like Niall described, and you migrate in the meantime, then this is transparent to the user, this means. Um, this, that the task is not reinitialized. So, for example, the task is not reassigned even if it's um, if there's a new assignment to find in the target process definition. Similarly, similarly, also the ID of the user task does not change. So, if you ah. start the user task, then migrate, and then complete the user task, then this is successful uh, typically. So. Um, the front end taskless user is not aware of the migration happening, and that way, migration does not interfere very much with uh, ongoing operations. Of course, there's always the chance that migration and completion of a task happen at the very same time, mm. and then you have concurrent updates to the same entities, and this cannot work. 
So there's the optimistic locking mechanism ah, of the engine see, then yeah. kicking in. And uh, for example, a user has to retry completion. But in the more likely cases where migration happens while the user is working on the task and only then the user completes it, then this is totally transparent. Okay, cool. Um, and is that the same? Is that ID sort of copied? for user tasks, but is it also copied for other types of tasks and events and things as well, or just user tasks? We try to um, preserve as much IDs as possible. So for example, the process instance ID, of course, stays the same. Um, okay, cool. The IDs of the event subscriptions stays, stay the same. So for example, for message events and signal events, um, the jobs of timers and asynchronous continuations oh, right. um, keep their IDs and so on. That's great, because that means that if you have an external system that communicates to the engine and you do an update, they're not going to like do stuff like they have a process instance ID they use to communicate. They're not going to need to update that. That's going to, oh, that's going to be the same the whole time. Yeah, correct. Okay, that's really good. All righty. Um, okay, um, if we have any other questions, um, we'll be happy to answer them. I think we've gone through this in, uh, in some a really nice amount of detail. So. Um, if you want um, myself or more likely scenario, uh, um, the Turbinator there to go through any uh, more stuff in detail or discuss things more, uh, please let us know and we can do that. Um, in the meantime, yeah, um, I just have sort of one little question, which is, about the um, what sort of additional API is actually created. So like we obviously have loads of cool API to uh, do this migration, but is there like any side effects of additional features that you've created that are available openly that could be used elsewhere for other reasons? Um, yeah, the two APIs that we saw were the creation of the migration plan and um, the execution of the migration plan. And mm. um, these are new APIs that we have added on top of the rest, and they don't interfere with the rest. Um, there's one more thing, which is the batching API. Um, this is currently only used for um, migrations. So if you migrate a very large number of process instances and want to execute this asynchronously, then a so-called batch entity is created. Um, and there's also um, methods in the management service in the Java API for um, yeah, querying for batches and introspecting batches to a certain degree mm -hmm. um, and history for batches. So when, when a batch finishes and these kind of things. And at the moment, we only use this for um, process instance migration. We imagine that we could use this for other things that we want to execute in batches. So for ah, example, yes. um, bulk cancelling of a lot of process instances would be one such thing that you could build with the batching infrastructure. And behind the batching infrastructure, um, the technically um, the job executor is used. Um, so there's no extra infrastructure required to run batches. Okay, that's really useful actually. So you can actually do stuff like could you actually right now use the batch API to, let's say, bulk start loads of processes the way it is? Um, no, it's in that sense closed, so it's not easily extendable from from users' perspective. Yeah. So right now you can migrate in batches. Um, yeah. I'm not super sure if you're going for internal API if you could build this easily. You would, yeah. You would have to find out yourself probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, all the everyone has all our code, so it's not. Uh, it's not hidden away or anything. Um, so, but it sounds like a nice thing. If the batching thing is a really good step for loads of other features that people have asked for before. Like loads of people ask for batch starting processes, batch. Um, I know I do for like testing and stuff. I'd be really useful for load testing actually. If you could use the API to straight away just blitz the uh, the uh, the engine with loads of batches of starting processes, um, that'd be a nice idea. Okay, so um, I think that actually brings, we're pretty close to the end now, so um, I think that brings us to the end of um, uh, of, of our presentation. Um, thanks a lot for sticking around and listening. If you have any other questions or you want more uh, info about all this fun stuff, uh, you can you can go to kimono.com for uh, the uh, enterprise stuff and the, uh, the sort of the money-making side of things. And if you're interested in uh, the open source uh, community, you can go to kimono.org and check out um, 
downloads like the modeler and uh, the, um, the various distributions uh, we have going. Um, in the meantime, um, thanks uh, TDOG for joining me today. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for, sh for signing up and showing up. And uh, we hope to have a few more of these soon. So do give some feedback about whether you thought this was okay uh, from a, <laughs> let's, 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 let's forget that brief moment where no one could see any slides and uh, uh, let us know if it was okay to do sort of a, a relatively technical talk and if that was useful to everyone. And um, that would help us produce these and uh, more of these in the future. Great, thanks a lot folks. And uh, we will say goodbye. Say goodbye to you, Doug. Goodbye.